Welcome, praise the name of the living God. Shall we just pray and then start for today? Father, we say we are grateful to you. We want to thank you for today. Thank you for such a time like this. Thank you very much that through this word, we shall receive strength in our inner personality and we shall be grounded in you. Thank you for the supply of the spirit. Thank you for the unction. Thank you that the eyes of understanding will be enlightened. And thank you above all that the name of Jesus will be glorified. I stop every influence of Satan lurking in the crevices of our mind in the name of Jesus Christ. I stop the influence of Satan by means of unpersuadableness, doubleness of mind, dullness of perception, slowness to understand, indifference, bigotry, pride, conceitedness, and unwillingness to yield to the word of God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I allow the light of the word to shine in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the name of the living God. Welcome to this lovely, lovely Tuesday edition of the teaching devotional Epic Gnosis Daily from the quarters of Full Gospel Church International, the London branch, Christ Revealed Center. And this is me, your host, Pastor Fred Abeka and Lady Patience Abeka saying, welcome to the teaching of the infallible Word of God. And let us just dive into this. And as we get ready for that, once again, I want to say that some of the things that I might say might be totally new to you, not new as in a revelation that we've never heard of before, but new in the sense that you might not have been exposed to such detailed explanation of God's word that takes into consideration all the interpretive analysis of God's word. Looking at the word of God, not in isolated verses, but looking at the word of God in context and also knowing very well that the curriculum of the born again man are the epistles from the book of Acts to the book of Revelation. All pointing to that everything is looked at to in the light of Christ. In the light of Christ in terms of what he has done for the believer. Very, very, very important that that remains a feature that we don't lose sight of. All right, today I want to go dive deep into what we did yesterday um, and then continue from there. So for those who probably missed yesterday or last week, I would, I would really beseech thee to go to our YouTube channel so that you can be able to glean in from what we did yesterday. Very, very important that you do that because I will not be able to go backwards and in terms of that. All right, so we've dealt with a few things and I want to highlight a few things. We've dealt with this, so I'm not even going to go back to that. I'm going to go to where we started up in whether the question of pleading the blood is biblical. That is what we've, we have already, we are on now and I want to start from there. I will not go back to all this. Anything, please go back to the YouTube channel. And let me, let me say it again. Never get familiar with the word of God. Don't get to a place that you think you know. Don't get to a place that you think you've heard it. Don't get to a place that you think that, you know, yeah, I know, you know, I mean, I'll just listen to it, but I'll not find personal time to study God's word. It's very, very important. Very, very, very important. If you don't learn to have a personal time with the word of God, it will always become difficult you would always go by shortcut. And you will always want to dwell on what I call the spectacular. What is the spectacular? Always wanting some, you know, some super miracle to happen. Then you know that God is alive, you know. But if you don't learn to go by God's word, you will never know God correctly for yourself. So you will always be hopping from spectacular to spectacular. And that is what is happening within the body of Christ. You know, many don't have time to settle with the word of God. And thank God that in this teaching, I emphasize that. 
and I've made it very easy. It has taken me over 20 years to come to where I am, and I'm still learning. I don't take my learning time as a joke at all, because that is the only place that I can have the personal, personal intimacy, intimacy with Christ. And I'm not learning it because I want to prove a point. No, no, I'm not, I'm not learning because I want to prove that I know the Bible. That, that, is a very, that is a very defeatist mindset. I learn it because I want to know it for myself, because it was given to us so that we may have good success. Joshua chapter, chapter 1, verse 8, it says that, Do not let this book of the law depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate on it day and night, to observe, to do all that is written therein. And then you, why owe you? will have good success. So the success is not even dependent on God because he has given it to you. By how? By the instrument of his word. Everything is in the word. But until you sit down and you study, you will never see it that way. And that is, that is where the enemy is deceiving a lot of believers. So I was, I was telling somebody that if you watch all the messages that come, especially in the circle of Africans, all the messages are about God will do something. God will do a miracle for you. God will do a miracle for you. God will do. So it looks like we are only looking to God only because we want things, but not because of him. And it's all right. There's nothing wrong to get the things. But when the things come, do you have what it takes to also maintain it? See that? It's very critical. And that's what the Spirit of God was ministering to me that, you know, my, my, my people are only just looking, just like those that Jesus, after he fed, 5,000, the next day a multitude came and Jesus told the disciples, you know, guys, let's move away from here. These guys, they are not coming because of me or the message. They are coming because they only just want miracles, as important as it is. Miracle, miracle is crisis mode. Miracle is crisis mode. A miracle is the suspension in the ordinary course of nature. That means that Naturally, that should not be the way. But because a crisis has come, God has to suspend some things and cause it to happen. But the blessing is the normal. The blessing is in the word that we should live in it. So if a believer does not have time for the word, it becomes seriously dangerous. Seriously dangerous. And I know what I'm talking about. Seriously dangerous. If you have no interest for the word, you have to begin to go into the word. And what I like about the word is that the moment you start studying it, inside the word has the power to cause you to love it. Philippians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12 says that, he says that, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. He's the one working you through the word. The word is him. Him is the word. The word is him. Him is the word. The word takes the place of the Christ we cannot, we cannot see. So to put the word or to park the word as a secondary place and rather love prayer or rather love, you know, only the miracles means that you have parked Jesus aside because you cannot separate Jesus from his word. And there's a serious word deficiency in the body of Christ. Prayer is very easy because speaking in tongues does not come from your head. It comes from your spirit and your spirit never gets tired. So I can speak in tongues for 20 hours. My spirit will never get tired. But the word informs you. Very, very, very important. Very important. So if, if we do only the word because we want something from God, and the moment we get what we want, we slack, we slack back. Then it means that it means that we need to do some growing up to do. We don't need to. We must be able to stay with the word, regardless. I've, I've trained myself like that. Regardless, money in the bank, money in the bank. Regardless, cars, no cars. Regardless, things are happening, things are not happening. Regardless, because that everything shall pass away, but not an iota of my word shall pass. The word is our resource. The word is our strength. The word is our light. David said, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. It shows you the way ahead. It will, it will get you out of trouble. It will, it will show deceptions. 
So until we have made the word number one in our life, we will still remain nepios. Nepios in the Greek is children. And Satan will start to toy with us. He will toy with our mind. He will toy with everything. So we need to get serious with the word of God. I always say, make a simple timetable. And don't go by feelings. Don't go by, don't go, I don't feel like it. Oh, I don't feel like it. I don't feel like it. You are being ruled by your feelings, not by the word. Very important. Now, once again, to get into this, and I know why, you see, if you keep on listening and you don't go into the epistles, you will struggle. You will soon fall back. You will soon fall back into religious thinking because the epistles are revelation knowledge. They explain to us all that Jesus did. So if you don't go into the epistles and you just pray or you just listen, after listening, the, 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 the Italian will say, ciao, ciao, or the Spanish will say, adios, bye-bye. No word, no word, no word, no word steady, no word steady, no word steady, one week, no word steady, two weeks, one month, four months, six months. Somebody will say, yeah, but does it matter? Jesus loves me, so what? He does, but there are things to be done on planet Earth which has been put in the word that will help you. The word was given to help you. In fact, if you study the word a lot, there are some things that you know even pray about. You know what to do. I heard of a man of God, I'll mention his name, who read the Bible cover to cover, cover to cover, cover to cover over 12 times. He started about five to 10 businesses without any education in management. The word is a multi-billionaire, a believer and a man of God. I won't mention his name. Just from the word. I also heard a story. I went into a bookshop. I went into a bookshop in, in East London. And I went into the bookshop and there was an Indian lady coming to buy Christian books. She spent money. And when the woman left, the attendant in the shop told me, he said, he said excuse me, sir, you know this woman? This woman used to sit in a wheelchair. She's an Indian. That means that she's a Hindu. And she got born again. She came into the store and bought a Bible. And she spent the rest of the days reading the Bible from cover to cover. She walked out of the wheelchair. She walked out of the wheelchair with no prayer. She walked out of the wheelchair. And there she was in the shop. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is quick. It's alive. Sharper than any double-edged sword. So God has put everything in his word. And you will not see it until you sit by the word. The word is not a storybook. It is not, it is not Mills and Boone. So that when you read it, it must excite you before, you know, some people, they want to always feel something first before they know that God is there. No, the word is simple. And until you stay in the word, there are some areas in your life that you think that it can never be achieved. But the word is there. So I'm saying that to, as a precursor to this. If you don't stay in the word, no, mat no matter the teaching, you will fall back. You have to have a personal time. You sitting by the word is your personal, intimate time with Jesus. Jesus is the word. In the beginning was the word. The word is God. The word is God. So when I sit with the word, it is Jesus. It's like Jesus sitting by my side, having an intimate chat with me about my life and how I should live it. So, so to do the word like secondary, yeah, 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 yeah. Put it in the background, yeah, this word. You know, or, you know, just um, two minutes. Uh, you know, it means, that, it means that you are not convinced that the word is life. That's, that's, that's the word. You are not convinced that the word is life. You are not convinced that the word can do anything about your situation. You don't see the relevance of the word. You don't see the relevance. Of it. And because if you are not spending time, that's why you can't see it. It's there. That's why Paul prayed in Ephesians 1. I pray that the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened. To behold what is already there. It's not like something coming from heaven. It is all in. God has put everything in the word. God wants us to know him by his word only. So now in coming to this question, is pleading the blood of Jesus biblical? I need to emphasize again this point. 
<laughs> that is the anointing. Is the anointing. The anointing. The anointing has kicked in. That's why I'm, I'm earnest like that. It's the anointing. When the anointing kicks in, he's emphasizing something. God knows what is going on. So he's emphasizing something. And God loves you and I. He's trying to say, get in line, get in line, get in line with the word before something, something, something worse. Get in line with the word. Because the word was there to help you. There are too many deceptions in the earth realm. So in studying this, in spinning the blood of Jesus, biblical, let me emphasize again before I dive into it. How do you know whether a subject is doctrinal or not? How do you know? I'm going to help you with that. How do you know if somebody, what somebody is preaching is true or not? Listen to me. How do you know if somebody is preaching the truth? Because there are many preaching. Because by now, some of you have that question about how do I know what Pastor Fred is preaching is the truth? Very simple. The answer is in the word. So let us stay. Now, first, you must understand that Jesus is the one that brought the curriculum, for lack of a better term. The curriculum of how the word should be explained. And I've read that already in Luke 24. He said all those things written under the Old Testament, not every little thing, but most of it was talking about me. Then he said, now that you know that it's about me, you this 11, later another person will come and add, Matthias, and later Paul will come and add, you this 11. Then now the, the basis of talking about me is the fact that I've taken away sins. So all the writings of the apostles from Romans to the book of Jude, they are an expans expansion of that concept of the sin remover. That means that as sin was removed, so what? So you are accepted. So you are the beloved. So you have the indwelling. So, so all the epistles are so, 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 so because of sin remover. So because of sin remover. So because of sin remover. That is all that the epistles are doing. They are telling you your position. Because your sins have been removed, you are accepted. Because your sins are removed, you are forgiven forever. Because your sins are removed, you are always accepted. Because your sins are removed, you have the seal of the spirit. Because your sins are removed, you have him as your mediator. Because your sins are removed, he's your intercessor. Because your sins are removed, you have the indwelling of the spirit. Because the sins are removed, you have sanctification. Because the sins are removed, you have righteousness. Because, because the sins are removed. So which one then becomes the main emphasis? So Paul said, at the mouth of two or three witnesses, I need to do this before I go into this. Because people don't know how to interpret the Bible. This is what the problem is. They think that everything in the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, means that God is telling us to do something. That is why people go into the Old Testament and pick verses, 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 verses. Then they say, it is in the Bible. So our problem is that because we think it's in the Bible, it means that God is telling us that we should be doing it. And they mix it with the born again man and the unbeliever, the one without Christ. So Paul said, at the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Where did Paul get that from? He got it from Jesus in Matthew. Jesus said, every matter must be established by two or three witnesses. Where did Jesus get it from? From Deuteronomy. At the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So what they are saying is that for any material to be accepted as a teaching, it must have been repeated two or three times in the letters of the apostles. Why? Because the letters of the apostles are known as the revelation of the Old Testament. How do I know that? Well, Romans chapter 16, 25 tells me so. That Paul said that according to the mystery which was in Christ, whereby in four time it was not revealed to them, but has now been revealed by my letters, by my gospel. Then in Ephesians chapter 3, 3 to 5, he says that by reading this, my gospel, when he said my gospel, my letters, you may understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was hidden. So Paul from Romans 16, 25 and Ephesians chapter 3 has made us understand that two witnesses, Romans 16, 25, Ephesians chapter 3, two witnesses that the letters of the apostles are the revelation of what was hidden under the Old Testament. Therefore, the Old Testament are not doctrinal material. They are only evidence of how Jesus would do it. 
So when something is not repeated twice or three times, either in one book, like the book of Romans or the book of 1 Corinthians, and it's repeated only once, it does not pass the test of credibility, which is at the mouth of two or three witnesses. So before you jump into, you know, concluding of anything, ask yourself, did, did Paul repeat it in either a particular book or did Paul or Peter or James repeat it all throughout from the book of Romans to the book of Jude? That is how you understand the Bible. Then you find out whether it was, there was evidence of it under the Old Testament. I'm helping you out. I know why I have to say this before I dive into this. Because I am not plucking this out of the sky. I am not coming with my own way to say that this is that. And once again, let me say, not many people know what I'm talking about. And it has nothing to do with age, size of congregation, size of church, or the name the person has made. It has nothing to do with that. This is revelation knowledge. The Bible is not about how old you are. David came on the throne when he was, a, he was a teenager. So it's not about how old you are. No. Peter was with Jesus. But Peter wrote only two books. First Peter, second Peter. Finish. Paul wrote two thirds. But he never walked with Jesus. He never saw him die. But these apostles saw them die. Even some of the apostles couldn't even write one book. James wrote one. James was the, was the head of the Jerusalem church. He wrote only one book. John wrote four. The Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Revelation. Paul wrote the rest. So the thing is about Revelation. So 2 Corinthians 31. This is the third time I'm visiting you. Every fact shall be sustained and confirmed by the testimony of two or three witnesses. So you have to ask yourself that question. When somebody brings a teaching... Ask them, can you show me where else Paul or Peter or James repeated the practice on their letters? And that's how the apostles did it. Now, you have to also be careful of this. The fact that somebody is quoting Bible verses, because I get that all the time, does not mean he understands it. Quoting them does not mean you understand. You have to link it with the context. You hear me saying this all the time. What does the context mean? What is that book talking about if i'm reading the book of romans and i jump into romans 6 1 and i say shall we continue in sin then i say you see you see he said that shall we continue in sin so when you are born again you can lose your salvation that is that is the most weakest way to do an argument because the bible was not done in chapters and verses the bible was done in a scroll it was one one long like we say back in my country logo logo line letter one long a seamless letter translators divided it into chapters and verses. So you have to start at the, at, the, at the chapter one and keep it at the back of your mind in the introduction of the writer, what is he talking about? So until it is repeated more than two or three times, it is not a practice. That's a very serious statement. It is not a practice. That is, how you, that is how you discern. So when I come and say that tithing is not for the born again man, you don't jump. You sit down and say, okay, let us go into the curriculum and look at it. Look through whether the apostles, because they are the foundational apostles. Jesus chose the 12. Plus later Paul came to lay foundation of the curriculum, which the church will use as a manual. If you don't understand these things, you cannot understand the Bible. So there's nowhere from Romans to the book of Jude, a single instruction was not given to the church of Christ to tithe. So also the same thing with pleading of the blood, not a single instruction. These are very serious things. <laughs> not, there's also one, when I touch on that one, I think there'll be third world, so let me hold on to that. God, I don't think that your spiritual capacity can handle that. So let me leave that particular one. I'll come to it later. So that is how you begin to see. Look through, scan through. Scan through. 
So let us go back into this field of that. I had to put that so I can do with, deal with this. So which means that that's what Paul said in Galatians chapter 1, that if even we, foundational apostles, or an angel comes and against this style of teaching the word, he said, cut him off. He didn't say hate him. He said, cut him off. It's a serious thing. And that's why many are, are confused. Because everybody is talking. Everybody is talking. Everybody is saying things that are not even related to what the apostles even did. We have even left that place. We have not even followed the, the, the pattern the apostles left down. We are not following. Everybody is doing their own thing. And then they'll say, Bible or no Bible, I don't care. If I hear something like that, I run like Usain Bolt, 100,000 miles away. And others are introducing concepts. I'm, uh, the Spirit of God is, is leading me in this direction. I know what I'm talking about. The, the people are bringing concepts in the Bible that even do not exist. They don't even exist. And one example is pleading the blood. So we look at the, we look at the etymology of the word to plead. And we found out that the word plead means to beg. To, all that, to beg. So the question you have to ask about yourself is that who are we begging? Who are we begging? Because the word plead means to beg. That's it. To beg. To plead guilty, not to guilty. It's a plea. A plea is a beg. It's an urgent appeal. So who are you making the urgent appeal on whose behalf? If you understand the principle and the concept of the word, of, of the fact that the blood, the blood was given only for one purpose, to remove sins. The blood was given, he said in Leviticus 17, 11, he said that the life of an animal is in the blood and I've given it to you to make atonement. That was the only purpose of the blood. The blood is symbolic of the death. The blood is symbolic of the life. He gave it for atonement to make up so that we become one. So if the blood has made you one with him and he lives in you and he has given you his word, like yesterday I was, we were doing with Sister Sherry, and he has given you his word, isn't that one enough? It's, it's not enough. The word is not enough. The spirit in you is not enough. Jesus as your Lord is not enough. Plus angels, the four, is not enough. It's not enough. Now, I want, I want us to think. I want to, I want to be a bit informal today. It's not enough. So are we begging the blood? We are begging. Why are you begging? Then that means that you have not understood salvation. You see, you see, you see it goes back to salvation. That's what Jesus said, preach it. If you understand salvation, that the man that is in Christ has been translated from the dominion of darkness, Colossians chapter 1, 13, 14, has been translated from the dominion of darkness and brought into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have the forgiveness of sins. It's a complete breakaway. You didn't leave Satan's camp in percentages. And he said, he made you to sit together. The word together is sukatizo. Sharing the same side. He didn't say he sits above us. We sit on the same level, same status. In the heavenlies, far above. You're already far above. Far above powers, principalities, minds, and dominions. Every name that can be named, you are far above. What are you begging the blood for? Your status is already above these forces. So the question as we go on to ask that, show me Bible verse. And we know our curriculum is the epistles where Paul wrote expeditious letters to any church in Macedonia, in Antioch, in St. Crea, where he told them that you must be pleading the blood. So now let me deal with some specifics now. Because anytime you talk about this subject, the next question and they bring about is what Sister Sherry brought up yesterday is what? The Passover. So the question you need to see when you're asking, when you're doing Bible, you have to be, you have to ask certain questions. So is the Passover 
and the fact that the angel of death, is he referring to a practice that we should do every day in our life? Do we understand the symbolism of those two? So when people speak of pleading the blood of Jesus in prayer, they are referring to the practice of claiming power of Christ over any problem by using the phrase, I plead the blood. I mean, you can fill in, I plead the blood of Jesus over. So you can fill in the blank. For example, I plead the blood of Jesus over my family, my job, my thoughts, my illnesses. Wait, wait. Are you a believer? If any man be in Christ, if any man be in, you are inside the man. You are joined to him. You are fused to him. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. It's not a separate spirit. Your spirit and his spirit are one. So how can the same spirit lack something that is not enough that I am intertwined with him and need extra help, what they call faith extenders? So pleading the blood of Jesus has no clear basis in the word. No one in the Bible ever pleads the blood of Christ. Paul didn't do it. Peter didn't do it. James didn't do it. Barnabas didn't do it. The only person under the evidence of the typology in the Old Testament to do anything with about blood is the high priest. And that refers to Christ and resurrection in the heavens. Those who plead the blood often do so as if it was something magical. And now it has become, the whole thing has become something else. In a football match, when they hit the ball, and the ball was about to score, and the, uh, the opponent's team that I am supporting, or my team, and people will be in the stadium shouting, blood of Jesus. Football! Football! They think that it has something magical in those words. As if by using them, their prayer becomes more powerful. So once again, it is this superstitious mindset. This teaching is born from a misguided view of prayer that a prayer is a way of manipulating God to get what we want rather than praying for his will to be done, which is, which is done already in salvation. The will of God is salvation. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, he said, For such praying is good and acceptable in the sight of our Savior God. Who wills? Who wills? That every man, who wills? Every man will be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. He wills that everyone will be saved. That's his desire. So the desire is salvation. Inside salvation, he has put the whole package, and salvation is a man called Christ. So the man Christ in you, is he not enough? That's the question. You see what I said in the beginning? When you don't study the word, you will not see the relevance of Christ. It appears that it's not enough. That is why people are brought in business school management concepts into the pulpit. Because the Jesus in the epistles is not working. That's the devil lying there. He's not working. We have prayed, 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 prayed. We have done all these epistles, epistles, epistles. I mean, I'm not seeing anything. You know what? I'm looking at Bill Gates. And I'm like, let us go and read some of his books and come and teach our people. It means that we fail to see. I'm not knocking entrepreneurship. It has its place but we are not seen. All of a sudden, the word, the word is, is, not, is not working. It's not working. It's not working. So now I need something powerful. So the whole thing has become like shrine. I need the blood, blood, do something, blood. Now they move, now, now other things are coming, blood. Now they are telling you, you need encounter. Oh, you need encounter. Until you have an encounter with God. Born again is the strongest encounter. You need to see Paul. Born again is the strongest encounter. So, so the moment you lose sight of the word, now you want to go for extra, extra linguistic curricula. You need now you want you want something that doesn't satisfy. It's like a person who smokes cigarette. After a while, the cigarette doesn't do what you want. So he now goes to weed. The weed is not doing. Now he goes to crack cocaine. Now crack cocaine. Now he goes to opium. That's how we do the word. We are not stable. The word cannot satisfy us. So now we need spectacular. 
The word, so the word has failed. But the apostles, even don't have what you have, do you realize that the apostles did not have the complete Bible like we have today? Hey, they had only Old Testament. Later, when Paul was in prison, he wrote some of the epistles and circulated one copy, one copy. But the Bible says that when Paul and Barnabas entered a city, the whole city said, the men who have turned the world upside down, they have come here with Old Testament. And we have it all, plus television programs, plus internet. Something is wrong. Something is seriously wrong. So this teaching of pleading the blood, it means that the word is not enough. The whole word of faith movement, which teaches pleading the blood, is founded on false teaching. That is faith as a force, and that if we pray enough faith, God guarantees us wealth, happiness, and and success. And I know where this teaching came from. I will not mention the man of God's name. Those who teach the value of pleading the blood of Jesus, usually, aha, uh -huh, now I'm coming there, point to Passover as a support of their practice. Okay, so now the question you have to ask yourself is that, what is Passover? And Jesus decoded it for us in Luke 24, when he met the two gentlemen on the road to Emmaus. He said, oh, fools and slow of heart, to realize that everything that was written in the law of Moses and the prophets, he said, were what? We're referring to me. Then in, in John 5, 39, he said that you search the scriptures. And we know the word scriptures means Old Testament, Genesis to Malachi. You search Genesis to Malachi. For in them, you think you have eternal life. But they are they that testify. It means that the Old Testament rallied around my person. The Old Testament was talking about me. The Old Testament was pointing to me in a style, in a figure, in a coded language. But you have failed to see it. You are seeing other things. You are seeing other things. And he's talking about me. How I will remove sins. So the main subject of the entire Bible is Christ Christocentric in nature. It's main story. I'm, I am whittling it down. The whole Bible is focused around two main events. Jesus as the representation, true representation of God and how he will remove sins, period. That is all. Why? Because sin was introduced by Adam. So all that they did from the story of Genesis chapter 2, where God brought a woman to man to marry, salvation, all of it. The Sabbath, he rested on the seventh day, salvation, Hebrews chapter 3. Let us go further from there. Genesis 3.15, the seed of the woman salvation how to remove sin go further noah the ark a type of salvation move further abraham and isaac salvation in christ why did it take him so long why did he have to go all through all these books to bring just this one point because it shows that the mind of man is dull when it comes to the revelation of christ so when we go there, we pick other things and leave and leave. So when we look at Passover, if the main issue was sin, so what is the typology of the Passover? Remember, the night before they were supposed to leave Egypt, the, the Egypt was a type of the world which was brought about by Adam. The angel of death is the same thing that Adam introduced. Romans 5, 12, for just as through one man, sin entered the world and death by sin, death. So death had a legal claim on mankind. Death was bellowing, I have them, I have them. Death had a legal right. So the only way in the interim, God's hands were tied because Adam sold it. So God had to find a way to protect the prophecy of the seed that he said from the beginning in Genesis 1. Verse 2, and then the Sabbath, and the marriage, and the 315. So he brought that Pascal lamb, that my seed is in this nation of Israel. 
through which the Messiah will come. I will not allow anybody to tamper with that line. That is why he told them, just as, just as in the law, when the blood is put to the mercy seat, your sins are covered for one year. So in the same way, I am protecting salvation. So use the blood on the doorpost so that you guys will not be extinct and therefore the Messiah will not come. Remember that in the generation of those people, there was the lineage of Joseph and Mary among those people. That is why in Matthew chapter 1, he goes back to the genealogy. Joseph, who was married to Mary, then he goes back, was the son of this, was the son of that, was the son of that, all the way to Seth, all the way to Adam, the son of man. So the Passover is not telling us that we should take blood, ribena, and sprinkle or say it, I, I plead the blood. No, it was talking about salvation in Christ. That is what it was typifying. That is all. Once again, because we fail, we dissociate that as a single event and not link it to Christ, we will run into error in the interpretation of it. Those, so those who teach the value of pleading of the blood of Jesus usually point to the Passover as a support for their practice. It is quite common for Pentecostalism to base its doctrines on an Old Testament example. Just as the blood of the Paschal Lamb protected Israel from the angel of death and led their deliverance from slavery, so the blood of Jesus. Now remember, blood is a metonymy for his life. He's not saying liquid homoglobin. I've taught that already. It's a metonymy, a figure of speech that talks about his life. So when the animals were sacrificed, they were saying that the life of the animal has temporarily taken the place, the place of the progenitor, the place of the culprit. But that was not enough. That is why it required another man, Christ. So he would do it perpetually. So those who plead the blood of Jesus often do so in context of seeking victory over demons. So once again, let's come to the epistles. I can give you three Bible verses that tell you that the believer is victorious, four, five, even six, over demons already. First of all, demons are fallen angels. First of all, they are fallen angels. You are in a class higher than them. They know that you are higher than them, but you are the one that doesn't know. It is like a police officer who is walking the street. Years ago, when I came to this country, I have not done anything, but the mere sight of the police officer, I panic. Because I know he has a higher authority to detain me. I have not done anything. The mere fact that I enter Tesco and the police officer come two or three, I'm sweating, cold sweat. Because psychologically, my mind is that, oh, how your authority has walked in. It's the same way demons feel when you walk into the office or you're in your house. They know it. The Bible says that even demons know it and they shudder. You are the one. They, they, are, they are whimpering. They are afraid. They are thinking, hey, hey, the light is here. The light is here. Let's pray that. Let's hope that he doesn't, he doesn't open his mouth and say in the name of Jesus. Let's pray that they don't speak in that language. Yes, yeah. You don't know how powerful you are in Christ. All you have is more than enough. So they say they want to plead victory with him. So watch Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. When Jesus resurrected, he said, Jesus, having disarmed Kabu Satire, the powers and the principalities, he did what? Past tense, disarmed. What tense is that? Past. That means they don't have it anymore. In Christ. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. That means that when Jesus resurrected, his mere resurrection was the disarmament of those forces. Some people have this idea that when Jesus resurrected, it was a fist blow between him and Satan. Hey, Satan, come, 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 come. Come here now. Boom, boom, 
Bop, bop, bam! No. Satan in him can. Because nobody had resurrected out of hell, Hades. Satan was the champion by reason of Adam's death. So after three days and three nights, all of a sudden, the man walked out. <laughs> the man walked out. That was the disarmament. Satan was like, oh, 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 who is this? The king of glory. <laughs> Open ye the gates that the king of glory may enter. Kabadaya. Satan realized that his hold over mankind. Remember, Jesus is the second Adam and the last Adam representing us. That means his hold on the human race is broken forever. So that is Colossians 2.15. Hebrews 2.14 says the children, his children are human. He, Jesus, became human so that through death, through death, he might destroy. The word destroy there does not mean annihilate. It means to render impotent, to paralyze, to put to naught, to render ineffective, to incapacitate. What are we talking about? This Jesus that we have is not, not a small dude, though. He said, he said what? The children were flesh and blood. He also became the same. That through that, he might destroy him. Who is the him? Satan and his cause. Him that had, that had the power of death. That is Satan. And free all who through their lifetime were held in bondage by death. For it is not the, to angels that he came to help, but the sons of Abraham, the descendants of Abraham in Christ. So that means the mere resurrection knock them out and the one who did it is in you and you're united with him isn't that victory enough then let's go to first john i'm giving you three witnesses now whosoever is born of god the word born of god is born again overcomes the world hey the mere fact that you are born again you have already overcome the world and this is our faith. So whosoever is born of God overcome the world. And this is our victory. Even our faith. The word faith is when you first believe the message of his death, his burial, resurrection. So this thing about our victory is not some, it's not some external feeling. It is a knowing. See, we, we dramatize it too much. So we think that if I, I'm praying and I don't shake my head in some way. Because when I got born again, that's the impression I got. The people who brought me up in Christ, when they are praying, they lift their right shoulder up and they turn their head some way and they are praying. So I thought, wow. So I thought the day that I didn't lift my shoulder and I didn't turn my head, then the prayer is not having impact. What is that? It is in words of knowledge. It is in the word of the knowledge of what he has done. Until so one day I went, to, I went to the late, I went to T.L. Osborne's crusade. And I saw at first hand, when he came to miracles, he didn't even shout. Hey, Mazuta Yaba, there is power in the knowledge. The man did not even shout. He would just call the people, cripple. He would just say, rise. The man, the paralytic is gone. Hear. Yeah. The ear pops out. See. The eyes are open. Kabayabaya. The Bible says in the Ecclesiastic, there is power in the words of a king. For the word of a king, where the word of a king is, there is power. It is in him who does it, not you. So to say I am pleading the blood so that I'll have victory over demons, it means you have not understood that Jesus finished them for you. So that one is not enough. Bleeding the blood of Jesus is a way of taking up the authority of Christ over the spirit and announcing to the force of darkness. It has been done. 
You see, our problem is this feeling thing. See, feeling. Feeling. Feeling is the voice of the body. Faith is the voice of the spirit. If you want to go by feeling, feeling. Eh, I pray, but I don't feel anything. I am not seeing anything. Did he say you see? Faith is the evidence of things not seen. He has told you that you won't see anything. Why are you trying to see something? So if you can't trust him by his word, and you know what, you know what shocks me? Dear wonderful saints, you know what shocks me? We will believe the word of a manager. You go to a job interview, and the man tells you you have got the job. You have not seen your first paycheck, yet you are making plans already. A human being like you and I, the man is even an unbeliever. He smokes, drinks beer, curses, curses your God. And he told you that at the end of the month, I am paying you 3,000 pounds. And you believe him. You believe. When you went home, you took the phone, phoned your friends, told them, I got the job. I got the job. Guess what? I am buying my new BMW. He can take off with your money. He can go to another country. You will never see him again. And when it comes to the word of God, when the man told you, you didn't have any feeling, feeling, feeling. You took him by his word. You took him by his word. An unbeliever. But all of a sudden, when it comes to God's word, I must have some feeling. I must have some feeling. I, I don't feel that I've, I've prayed it some way. So I'm feeling. No, I need, I need Ribina. I need Ribina to do something. It is all a matter of identity crisis. We have not anchored in who we are in Christ. Let me take the last one. This one today, you see, they don't read it well. Then they all come and quote this one. Revelation 12, 11. I mean, the answer is even there. I'm pleading because they said that they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. Wait. And the word of their testimony. Wait. You are reading out of context. Did you not read? They overcame. Not going to overcome. They overcame. They overcame. Past tense. The overcoming has been done already. So bask in it. That's what he's saying. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb. The word blood is what? By his death and burial. He has been overcome already. He's not saying that you must go and use the blood. So the, because they are, they, are, they are using, they are doing logic thinking. Trying to use logic. Uh, but because the blood overcame him, so when I use the blood, I'm overcoming Satan. But he has been defeated already. Okay, then the final, the final witness, and I close. If you don't believe anything that I said, let us look at Jesus. And I'll close with that. In the temptation of Jesus, Luke chapter 4, I want to ask you, go and read it carefully. When Satan came in the mind of Christ to tempt him, it, he, what did he use? Because somebody will argue and say, but he had not. Jesus showed us the prime example. How did Satan attack? How did Satan attack? By words of suggestion. How did Jesus respond? Did he shout? Did he jump up and down? He said, it is written. That's all. Then the man quoted, then it is yet written. Then the man quoted Psalm 91. And in the Psalm 91, he twisted it. Read it well. He added something that I don't have the time to go there, which was not there. But Jesus ignored it and quoted again. And that was the end of the story. Showing you that the word is efficacious. The word is adequate until, um, let me say it in conclusion again. That's why I started with that. Until you come to that point and know that the word is enough. Oh, you'll be deceived. That's what I'm trying to get at. That's, and that's where the battle is. Satan will not allow you to settle with the word. The moment you want to read the word, phone calls, things will happen. Da, 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 it's gone. The moment, because he knows that's where the power is. The word. The word. And until you get into it, you will not see that way.
So if they told me that there is something somewhere in London Bridge which lets you get money, wouldn't I go there? And they are telling that the word is everything. You should die for it. You should die for it. You should die for it. The word is everything. This word that I'm reading, is, it created the world. Don't you get it? The, this word was spoken. It created, ah, yeah, 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 yeah. It created the world. So what created the world is inside me. What can it not produce? Then I will die with it. Ah, I will give myself to it. Whether it's comfortable or uncomfortable, whether it feels right or not, whether I have a feeling or not, I will stay with the word. I will study the word. I will dive in the word. I will imbibe the word. I will get in me. I will saturate. I will oversaturate. Because it was the same thing that defeated Satan. Why would I have to waste time? Why do I have to wait for a feeling? I would die with the word. I would die. I would drink it until it come out of my ears. And I don't care what somebody is doing. This is me. I will give it all my time. I will give it all my attention. I don't, mean, I don't lose anything. If it means I'll have to sit down for four hours, I will do it. I'll do it one hour, give break, come back. One hour, give break, come back. One hour, give break. Because I value, I value the word. I value the word. Until that happens, concepts like this will take the place of the finished work of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Let's see if we have any fast questions. Glory, glory, glory. Any questionario? I think by now you would have understood. I don't even need to continue with this explanation because it's, it's really clear. It's very clear. Very clear. Do we have any question? All right. Hello, praise God. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yay. Mr. Sherry. Mr. <laughs> I don't have a um, question, but I have a testimony. Hey. Hey. No. <laughs> I just want to thank God. And it just happened now. If we could all remember, there was a time I requested for prayer, which regarding to a parcel that I sent to Nigeria, which is a very important document. And it was all messed about. And I recall after then, I also called Pastor Fred and we prayed together. I just want to give God the glory. It, it was a long delay because it was supposed to take one month. It took about um, one week. It took about a month or over. But my brother just collected it. He snapped it. Everything intact. He sent it to me on WhatsApp. He's on his way back home now. So everything was intact and delivered. I just praise God. Woo! So it was a delay. The spirit is telling me there's a reason for it. And I just give God the glory that everything is intact. So I just want to say that the Lord is good. The Lord answers prayers. He might not do it the way or the time we want it, but he still does it in his own way and his own time. So I give God the glory for answer prayers. And I thank God for this platform in Jesus' name. Thank you, everyone. Oh, praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you because I'm trusting him that the others will pray for both myself and every other person's prayer request. I'm trusting and I'm thanking God because he is faithful. He He's going to do it in his, oh. own, in his own will and his name will be glorified in such a way that man cannot take the glory. Oh, I like that. So I like I that. Praise God. Thank God. Thank God for this platform. Thank you, everyone. Hallelujah. God Hallelujah. God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Sister Sherry, you always drop some still little, little nuggets. I like what you say. It says that we pray, but God has answered, but it will come in a way that we least expect. And that is also another area. God always answers prayer. But the little problem is that how it will come and when it's come is what we don't know. But he has answered See, in a way. And most of the time, by the time you know it manifests, you know, you look back, yes, it is it has been done in a way more than you even expect, or in a better way. Let me let me put it in a lack for a better language, you know. So 
I love that, what you just said, in a way that we least expected. And I've done that mistake so much in the past, whereby when I pray, I'm expecting that, if, if, for example, if it's money, I'm expecting that, oh, it's Uncle John who is going to bring their money. But it will come from Sister Mary. <laughs> and more than what I even expected from Uncle John. So, you know, it's all part of, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. Glory to God. That's a, that's a good encouragement there. That's a good encouragement. All right. Whoa, 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 whoa. I think there are no questions. But I think this topic, I don't know. Maybe I'll just do a part B of it tomorrow, but I don't know. But I think it's, it's um, I'm, I'm done there. That, that, that should be very clear. It should be very, very, very clear. Very clear. Once again, don't forget the fact that if anything it needs to be a doctrine, it needs to be repeated two or three times in the curriculum of the epistles. Very simple. Check out Paul. Check out Peter. Check out James. I mean, that means that each of them should not say it only once. They must be, it must be commensurate with all of them. So even if Paul says something once somewhere, one Corinthians like that, but none of the other apostles repeated it, then it's probably a historical cultural context. Or maybe he repeated the same thing in the same book twice or three times, then that's fine. Like speaking in tongues. First Corinthians chapter 12, 13, 14. Even though 13 is the love, the love talk, but the love is connected to the gifting, the charismata. Then 14, then even 15. So he has covered it completely before Romans chapter 8, 26, and Jude and Ephesians chapter 6. See that? So it's, it's clear that that is an important factor. But if it's mentioned once, it was never mentioned anywhere within the same book or the other writers, then it is just a cultural context. All right. I love you all with the love of Christ. With the, I, like, I feel like doing a break dance, but I can't do a break dance. <laughs> oh, I'm only kidding. It's just me. Praise God. Thank you, Sister Ruth. Thank you, Sister Ruth. Bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. Bless you all for your faith, faithfulness. Awesome. Thank you, Sister Sherry. What can I say, Sister Sherry? Wow, bless you, bless you. Sister Angela, what can I say? Oh, my goodness me. Sister Vivian, whoa, 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 whoa. What can I say? Sister Jennifer, what can I say? And look at this one, look at this one. Brother Elisha, all the way from Ghana in West Africa. Awesome. I salute you, I salute you, I salute you, I salute you, I salute you. Well done, well done, well done. The consistency, the time, the guy is there. Look at that. They don't have quote, quote, broadband like we have, but he is there. Bless you, brother. Keep up the good work. And of course, the last but not the least, my own, own bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. Lady, patience. Now, please don't forget, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel so that when there's any message, I'll upload it. You see the notification, so you can go there. And it's even better because the YouTube channel, when you go there, you don't have to. It will not download on your phone. Because if I send the message to you personally, it will take space on your phone. But YouTube is in cloud, so after you finish watching it, it just goes back to the cloud. So it doesn't take space on your phone. And you can always go deep in and out constantly. The good news about it, when you are watching, you can pause it, rewind, forward, and make notes. Fantastic resource for you to bring the things. But in addition to your Bible study. Amen. Have a lovely day. Enjoy it. We love you. And bye, 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 bye for now. Bye. And invite others also. Invite others to enjoy this wonderful teaching in Jesus' name. Bye for now. Bye, bye, bye. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you.